This week's episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 26th of October 2022 at home in Wicklow. And in it, I talk about some ideas and issues and reflections prompted by the watching of three different Netflix productions, all documentaries. One about the clothing company Abercrombie and Fitch, one about the sports clothing company and one, and then a documentary series about a junior college basketball team, Last Chance U Basketball. And having watched all of those in the last week, I couldn't help but reflect on ideas around race and identity and representation and status and class and opportunity in the US. Uh, obviously, as a you know, watching from a distance, um, but I tried to contextualize some of those ideas into an Irish context. And yeah, just a bit of bit of stuff to kind of sink the teeth into and that's um that's what's coming up that's what's coming up in this week's tell so um yeah i'll see you there right around the corner cheers oh, not gonna change my mind leaving the dream behind hi my name is dara clear and you're listening to the clear out you're very welcome this is Wellness with Attitude. And today's episode is going to focus on, on what? Image, representation, identity. Identity is a, is a theme that uh, I regularly cover on the, on the tell. But um, yeah, it's very much a part of, very much a part of uh, what I'm going to get into today. And um, I'll get there. I'll get there in due course, but first a weather report. <laughs> uh, another week on the leaves, the leaves are really showing their lovely autumn colors and the garden's covered in leaves. I have to get out there with a rake. How exciting. Always cutting edge stuff here on the clear out. But um, this morning I released, I released my latest single. Now I released my cat out into the wild. So Ruby, assistant to the head of marketing, Ruby is, uh, oh, she must be a year old now. She's over a year old. And she's always trying to get out there into the wild to strut her stuff. So I let her out this morning and um, <laughs> I didn't see her. She, she went somewhere. And then the next thing, I just saw this blur this furry blur like an exocet missile being fired across the garden and it was ruby and i guess the wind got up her butt she was moving at speed <laughs> so just g galloping across the garden and that was grand out of sight i was carrying on my morning and then i had to i had to get out there and uh, release the finance department that would be the chickens Edwina, Charlotte and Bobo so they were squawking and carrying on in their in their coop so I had to release them but as I went to get them out and they're at a kind of a higher position a sort of a, a mezzanine if you will uh, level in the garden I was about to go up, get up there and in the field behind yet again a furry blur, Ruby disappearing across the field to the property beyond ours, uh, like like a gazelle fleeing a lion, um, bounding across the field at speed, and yeah, just um, <laughs> looks like something out of a cartoon. Just comically, comically fast, <laughs> effortlessly, comically bounding 
across the across across, across the land. Um, and she came back a couple of hours later, um, and is now absolutely <laughs> panned out, crashed out on on the couch in uh, in one of the other rooms there. So um, that gave me a laugh. I was uh, highly highly entertained by this um, this amphetamine <laughs> uh, kitten. Great. Anyway, there you go. So I am on my own. I am on my on my own. I'm on my own. I've been left behind. My my girls, the women in my life, the human animals in my life, my wife and daughter, <laughs> set sail for Australia yesterday. In fact, they took flight. They didn't set sail. Um, so they've been. Yeah, they're not. I don't think they. I don't think they've arrived yet in Australia. Um, at the time of recording, they haven't arrived. By the time this is out, they will have. So they are on their way. They are. They'll probably touch down in a few hours. That twenty-four hour trip. What a joy it isn't. So, I'm as they say in Australia. I'm batching it. I remember when I first came across that living in Australia. I was like, "What the hell are they talking about? Am I a baker? Am I making a batch loaf?" Which was the only batch I knew of. But no, as ever, as ever, with uh, the Australian way of abbreviating everything, batch was short for bachelor. And so batching it <laughs> means, yeah, you're, you're on your own. You're being a bachelor again. So yes, I'm going to be a bachelor for the next uh, five weeks, approximately. Just me and the kittens, the kitten and the cat. And the guinea pigs. Oh, I can never remember what the guinea pigs are responsible for in terms of their their area of expertise um, in terms of what they do for the podcast. They generally just eat and chirrup. That's a word. I guess it rhymes with stirrup. They chirrup and they popcorn around their cage. Those of you who have guinea pigs will be familiar with the concept of popcorning it sounds a little bit dirty sounds like it could be a euphemism for something a little bit inappropriate for daytime television but popcorning is when a very excited and happy guinea pig again straying into dubious territory but let's think of this in very innocent terms it's when a very happy and excited guinea pig does these sort of impromptu jumps in the air as it parades around its turf and that and they make a little squeaky sound at the same time that's popcorning like like a, a kernel of popcorn hopping in the popping and hopping in a hot pan that's what guinea pigs do so they especially like to do it after a good feed ah <laughs> oh dear so this is it am i going to go mad without the the commitments the demands the engagements, the dynamics of having my wife and daughter here are, am I going to sail out into an ocean of serenity and become extremely chilled and mellow? Perhaps, perhaps not. There's always stuff to be done. There's always stuff to be done. So, yeah. Okay, so look, um yes today this is sort of a uh, what i'm not really sure how to frame this but i've watched a few things on netflix in the last week and somehow not somehow but like very clearly race issues and race issues in america and race division in America um, and power dynamics connected to race. They're all in the mix uh, of these three things that I've watched. And so and it's kind of coincidental. Um, so there's also something to do with 
class and exclusivity and ex- exclusion um, in, in, in the mix of this conversation. So, yeah, it's just kind of got thoughts percolating. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the end point of this reflection forward slash discussion will be. Um, but I just felt there's a lot to to kind of have a little pick at and and see if if something is uh, sufficiently interesting to um, to spend a bit of time on. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so basically, this is what I watched in the last week. I watched an entire series of, or sorry, an entire season of the Netflix documentary series Last Chance You. Now, if you're not familiar with that series, Last Chance You um, has had about four or five seasons on Netflix. And basically, it's a, a documentary series that looks at junior college sports teams in different parts of America. And each season focuses on a particular year in the life of a junior college and, and a year in the life of the sports team of choice, the sports team that the, the, the producers have chosen to focus on. And the first three or four seasons, they the series focused on American football teams. And the sort of social commentary aspect of the shows uh, is fundamentally looking at young, underprivileged men, uh, mostly black, it would seem, generally speaking, mostly black, mostly coming from pretty tough um, backgrounds, very underprivileged, as I said, backgrounds, somewhat disenfranchised. And these are guys who aspire, young guys who aspire to getting into professional sport in America as their as their golden ticket to try and capitalize on their talent as young athletes. Um, and because of their background and opportunities that they haven't had and financial limitations, these aren't guys who have a natural pathway to the top academic institutions um, with great sports programs in, in the USA. And so there's a sort of a, a stepping stone to between high school and top level um, academies. The stepping stone is junior college, or as they abbreviate it in the show, JUCO. And so you get into junior college and you do well there, and that can be an opportunity for sports scouts from the big colleges to see you and go, yeah, come here. And then that can be the beginning of the real pathway to potentially playing in the NFL um, or whatever. So I watched, I think I watched a couple of those seasons um, in, in when it first came out. I found it pretty interesting, some pretty interesting characters. Definitely human interest stuff there definitely interesting as social commentary and of course if you like sport there's always that aspect the very classic uh sports narrative arc um playing against a team are they going to win is this player going to deliver is there going to be an injury is this player going to you know manage his emotions is the coach going to find a way to unlock that defense uh, what are the, the tensions and dynamics within the group? Is the coach finding the right way to, to motivate and train these young men? Is the coaching team who support the coach, is there tension there? Are they fully on board? Um, you know, what are the, what are the sort of the, 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 the teaching and training philosophies? Um, inevitably, these coaches are quite big personalities and that's, that's definitely part of the attraction um part of the attraction of the the series and the one i just watched last week the i think it's the most recent um season of last chance u um and that's u as in the letter u as in university um last chance u they switched codes they switched sports and decided to look at basketball uh so that that series that sorry that season is up on netflix now if you're interested And it's just called Last Chance U Basketball. And it focuses on a young basketball team in their 2019 into 2020 season. And they are students at East Los Angeles College, ELAC. 
and they are being coached um, by a black coach. His name is John Mosley, and he is a good, God-fearing man, a good Christian man. And one of these, um, one of these figures who you can see is giving absolutely everything he's got to to help the young men in his care and to make them better basketball players but as he says to try and help them become better men and ultimately yeah he wants to win he wants to win basketball matches he wants them to do well he wants them to excel but ultimately he wants them to get opportunities to move up in the world i mean that really is his kind of stated ambition and it's an eight part season and it's it's great he's he's a really charismatic figure and very driven and there are some really interesting young men on the team with some very interesting backstories and there's something about that particular season that um i don't know the like the elements kind of held together a bit more and i don't know if it's because uh i think this was the first season of the show where there was a black coach with black kids uh, there's one white guy on the team there's, and uh, uh, there is a joke made about that at one point but it's all um young men from african-american backgrounds and the you know with a black coach as well so there's a sort of a there's a connectivity there's an understanding there's an empathy um and it's sort of for me anyway i just felt there's something a bit richer here there's something a bit deeper here there's more opportunity here for um well it's funny the word that comes to mind is love and there is something very palpably you know loving and moving um in the sort of i suppose the like the the platonic sense in the the mentoring sense i suppose there's some really you know good people running the show so uh, the, the coach obviously and his his assistant are just two very good guys who clearly have enormous affection for these often quite troubled young men in their care and it's you can't watch it and not be aware of the fact that these are predominantly black kids and many of them coming some from single parent homes and just come from very tough stories and that's in the mix like it's it's part of it's part of the story it's not you know it's not explicit they're not wearing that on their sleeve they're just getting on with it um but i found it really really um yeah i do, i found it really really entertaining and um there's no question that you get the sense of just the sort of the ambition of some of the the the, the young men on the team their ambition their their desperation to to you know to take to make the best of the opportunity that's there um, and hoping it will it will um move into a greater opportunity that it will be you know converted or transformed or transmuted into a better opportunity further down the track as long as they can get the results and of course that's the the sporting narrative of the of the show is these guys are winning and they're winning ugly and they're winning tough but they keep on winning right through the season and the ultimate goal is to win the state championship at the end of the year um and as i say 2019 into 2020 and what happened in 2020 the pandemic so that's there from the start going the timeline on this where is this going to end is their talent going to get them to the final is their talent going to get them to that moment of glory that their hard work and their togetherness 
um, deserves, that it merits, that it warrants, that all John Mosley's efforts um, have warranted. And it's great. There's just great kind of drama and tension in it. And it's really, I, I thought it was really well directed. Um, yeah, just really, you know, and, and consistent with the previous seasons. But I, I just found it really, really, really interesting. Um, so that was one of the things I watched. And as I say, that's that's out there right now. You can go and watch that yourself if you're interested in such things. I know, hi, Sean, I know you're listening. I know Sean will be watching now that he knows about it, if he hasn't already got onto it. Uh, Sean, big basketball fan. Uh, hope you're doing well, Sean. Hope your travels are going well. That's that's Sean, Sean Whitehill, the my friend and the travelmandalas.com artist. Um, so yeah, Sean's a big basketball man. So Sean, check that out. Now, I also watched two other Netflix productions. Um, one, both documentaries as well. And one was another basketball one called The Rise and Fall of And One. And that's And with number one. And One, I didn't know about it because... I'm not really interested in such things. But And One is a sports brand, or was a sports brand. Um, T-shirts and basketball shoes. And One was a company founded by three white guys in America in the early 90s. And they came up with this concept of marketing sort of street culture and hip hop culture connected to kind of street basketball you know ba- you know street games where there was a lot of um kind of dissing and slagging off your opponents and trash talking your opponents and these guys came up with the idea of well why don't we you know put that put those those slags those disses on on t-shirts and they came up with a sort of an iconic faceless basketball player like an automaton like basketball player with uh with a blanked out face and they throw um a classic kind of diss on the t-shirt underneath the figure um and the the brand just exploded it took off massively and the the guys behind the brand we're constantly looking well how can we expand how can we grow how can we be, how can we become competitors against the big sports brand and, and nike um nike was the one nike was the one they wanted to sort of you know to take on um as 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 the young turks and they 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 step put you know dipped their toe in the water of shoe making and they made a basketball shoe and they thought this is going to be big and they they took a punt on their success and recruited a draft pick so my understanding fundamentally in the nba the basketball association in america um if you're a top prospect um a college basketball player who's made a name for himself there's a draft uh, at the beginning of each season to see which team will basically get to employ recruit hire the hot college talent and there's a draft it's a massive massive event every year it's on tv it's covered by everyone everyone wants to know like who's going to be the top draft pick who's going to get the hot talent and you know the question always is will that talent then go on to to achieve will they come good on their promise will they cut it at the highest level and and one decided okay we're gonna we're gonna um get a guy on board with our brand before he's even been drafted and then he'll be our brand ambassador for our new basketball shoe so they got the the number four pick i think um again i'm talking to someone who doesn't watch (laughs) who doesn't watch uh basketball the nba uh, apart from a handful of the most famous names i wouldn't really know anything about it but this guy was i think stephen marbury was that his name anyway it's a very kind of dramatic moment in the documentary because he is playing one of his first games, if not the first game, um, his first NBA game. He's got the shoes on and he goes up and, you know, makes a, you know, makes a basket 
and he comes down in the and one shoes and breaks his ankle and <laughs> it's just this horror moment again if you're putting this into a very conventional narrative of yeah we were everything was going really well and we you know we staked it all on this and then basically the guy was like the, the guy's agent was like i'm gonna get my player my hot player to we're gonna make an ad and do a tv spot of him throwing your shoes in the bin um and so the, the and one guys were like oh man back to the drawing board so ultimately ultimately how they really exploded their brand and exploded their popularity um was they they started to promote really talented street basketball players so these are guys who didn't make it to top level you know the top level of competitive basketball but guys who were really skillful and particularly skillful doing tricks and kind of unpredictable moves with the basketball and guys that had low huge local followings um and had names like hot sauce or skip to maloo um oh, i can't think of the other ones but they were there two that stand out and what they would do is they'd, they'd start making you know do video recordings of these guys and they were start they, they started to kind of distribute their you know what they call their the, mixtape the and one mixtape of these hot basketball players which they'd give out with their t-shirts when people bought their t-shirts and then ultimately they started touring around the country with these guys and doing events and you know ex exhibition games and then they took it to the next level and they wanted to try and recruit the new kind of top basketball player you know for that kind of street game style of basketball and ultimately they came across this very skinny small white kid who yeah he had all the right moves and the he his name became the professor uh and was part of again the whole kind of you know the, the branding the success the ascent and what it was was these guys had basically tapped into you know black culture street culture um you know the language the iconography the color the fun um the sort of the attitude and they were bottling it in their brand and then they had a second pop at making shoes and they did really well um and they took off and how lovely is that great it's a real happy consumerist story um ultimately nike was like whatever they can do we can do better and they sort of replicated the and one formula and sort of muscled them out of the market um and that that kind of led to the the the, the company's demise in fact I, i'm not even i don't even know if the um how you know where where it is if it's still going if it's still out there but it was really hard not to feel watching the documentary that these three white guys had capitalized enormously on the back of black culture and i suppose the word cultural appropriation i don't know, I don't know if that's if it's the right context to use that phrase but they were definitely coming in and kind of going isn't this cool um and won't it be great to to kind of you know like to sell this and you kind of go well objectively you step back and go okay well you know whoever whoever saw that as the opportunity fantastic but in the documentary you're you know there's, there's interviews with the you know the former players all black guys apart from the professor um and it's clear that some of them some of them feel well hold on we didn't really get a cut we didn't really get you know we didn't get points and in, you know one of the white guys and you, you can't help but think these guys are framing their answers to suit the the cultural climate now because you know the, the documentary only came out this year he's saying oh yeah you know maybe we shouldn't have um you know looked at those guys as players um and brand ambassadors maybe we really should have looked at them as employees and then they could have all had stock 
they could have had you know we could have you know in, included shares in their compensation and they all would have done really well and um <laughs> i'm looking at that guy going yeah that that would have been nice um now again i'm not kind of going oh you know what an arrogant white guy you know exploiting the black man you're thinking well 20 years ago um i don't know like is that an indication is that an indication of how the conversation has changed about how the discourse has influenced the way people are thinking about these things or was it just a sort of an intellectual property idea where these guys are like well we came up with this this is our baby and why in god's name would we be you know giving people points that we feel they don't deserve um i don't know because again i'm not a business person and so maybe a business person looks at that objectively and without taking color race into consideration go eh, it's a no-brainer you know you, you keep as much of the company as you can for yourself especially when it's doing so well i don't know but there's no question that the black players involved some of them anyway were just very clearly going hold on you know yeah we were getting paid money at the time there was um a, a large sort of disparity between how much different players were getting depending on how popular they were with the crowds with the branding um so it, it felt kind of loosey-goosey um and i don't know how many of these guys had representation or agents uh looking after our managers looking after their interests or if they were just doing their own negotiation with the company um but certainly there's one kind of there was one yeah weird moment in the documentary when one of the former players was saying you know i approached the guys and said look um can you help me out financially i want to get my son into you know some college or into some program i need sixteen thousand dollars um and it was just a you know it was just kind of a straight no and then they go to one of the the white owners of the company now who says yeah that might have happened that may have he may have spoken directly to me and i you know i've I've forgotten and if i if you know if that is the case i feel very sad about that it was just really what <laughs> are we really meant to believe that it just looked so dodgy um anyway it's yeah like it's yeah it's strange times it's strange times strange times i mean i found myself just kind of I found myself wanting more. I found myself wanting more from the story. Come on, give me more. What like what what really transpired here? Who, you know, what were the, you know, what were the the dynamics? What were the grievances? How what was the level of awareness of this this kind of disconnect, this gap between we're making so much money here and yeah, it's all like it's 99.9 percent .9 black guys out there who've come from the streets yeah we're giving them money yeah we're putting them on big fancy tour buses yes we're taking them around the world and yes there's been an explosion in their popularity um but how much awareness was there in like you know this is how much we're making this is how much they're way making and look don't get me wrong again not a business person and I know business isn't meant to be a democracy. We're not all meant to get the same share. Um, but there is something about, well, okay, the talent, where is it coming from? Um, how, without those guys, we don't have a company. We don't have a brand. We don't have an identity. Or rather, we, we wouldn't have been catapulted. We, you know, we wouldn't have been able to um, platform the brand the way we did without the skill of these young black men i you know there's something there was something left unsaid in the documentary and you can't help but feel this is an issue then you know documentaries are journalism aren't they aren't they a form of journalism um isn't aren't they meant to be a form of truth telling isn't there meant to be some form of you know taking us deeper getting us closer to what was going on so the, the it, this documentary felt sort of superficially interesting, but ultimately, you know, I wanted more. Which brings me to the next one I watched, which was called White Hot. 
which I think is called The Rise and Fall, another Rise and Fall, of Abercrombie and Fitch. So Abercrombie and Fitch, if you don't know, or if you don't remember, Abercrombie and Fitch is a clothing brand that was enormously popular. Um, I'm told, according to this documentary, <laughs> enormously popular with kind of late teenagers and people in their early 20s about about 20 years ago. Almost the most popular clothing brand in, 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 in the States, in the USA. And you're going, okay, grand, whatever. And basically it was a sort of a sporty preppy waspy kind of brand you know know, these brands that sort of look like they have sort of college logos across the front big brand the big name Abercrombie and Fitch Abercrombie and Fitch started off as a sort of an outdoor clothing company in the 1800s people like Theodore Roosevelt and Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh wore Aber crombie and fitch apparel so it was for like kind of adventurers people on safari transatlantic solo flight uh you know pilots um you know the outdoorsman the outdoor person clothes you know fit to (laughs) clothes fit to colonize how about that for a concept clothes for the colonizer and it had huge popularity it would seem right up until the late 60s early 70s i think by 1977 it 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 filed for bankruptcy um and then it was taken over it was taken over by um an american businessman called i want to say lex lex luther not lex luther lex Les, maybe Les. <laughs> Les, was it Les Wexner? I think that might have been his name. Let me check. I'm just going to check this. Um, I mean, again, you can just look this up yourself if you're interested. But um, this guy, um, who's an older man now. Yeah, let me see. What's his name? Leslie Wexner. Leslie Wexner. That's it. Leslie Wexner was um, someone who was basically a sort of like a a retailing colossus, a retailing guru, a retailing wizard, this guy who worked out, you know, how to conquer, how to conquer the mall in America. In fact, I think he had a nickname, the uh, the wizard of the mall or the, um, uh, the Merlin, the Merlin of the mall. And he took over Abercrombie and Fitch. He's also a guy who was behind uh, Victoria's Secret, and certainly his reputation has taken a massive hit because of his closeness to um closeness to Jeffrey Epstein um who seemed to be the uh procurer of young women for the rich and famous um uh, particularly the rich white and famous uh, Jeffrey Epstein who we're led to believe took his own life um while in prison a couple of years ago um I'm I'm not sure about that one. I think um I think I think he was taken out because he knew too much. People like uh, Prince Andrew are implicated in the Jeffrey Epstein scandals. People like Bill Clinton, I think as well. Um Trump um whatever. Anyway, Leslie Wexner, another good pal of Jeffrey Epstein. But Leslie Wexner took over Abercrombie and Fitch and entrusted its care to Mike Jeffries. Mike Jeffries then was the brainchild behind making Abercrombie and Fitch really popular again. This was in the uh, in the in the nineties, and Mike Jeffries. If you see a picture of Mike Jeffries, he's again very white. He's like a, he's in the sort of the the, the t- sort of JFK Bobby Kennedy. Um, I want to say Cape Cod. Is that right? Is that the right reference? Beachy, waspy, preppy, very white, as I say. You know, 
there's sort of a, a Robert Redford-esque thing there as well. And yet, at a glance, there's also something a bit off. And it does emerge. So at some point, someone in the documentary refers to his plastic surgery. Some not, not great plastic surgery Botox, I guess. So he's, he's kind of like a, a mutant Kennedy. Uh, that was really my my framing as I as I saw him, and he fundamentally had this vision of Abercrombie and Fitch being exclusive clothing for beautiful young white people. That's it. That's the pitch, and kind of I guess in to an extent made in his own image. Um. I because I I can't I didn't get the feeling that it was a purely business consideration. It he feel this guy feels like an ideologue, and he's definitely fetishizing um, white American beauty of a certain kind, um, of a wealthy kind, um, preppy, privileged, upper class, and. Again, you kind of go, okay, is that a story in and of itself? I mean, it's a choice. It's a choice. This is the aesthetic we want. This is who we are. This is what we represent. You go, okay, yeah, okay, grand, whatever. Um, I mean, Abercrombie and Fitch was on. It was. It would have been on my kind of peripheral, on the peripheral of my radar. I was aware it was a brand. I kind of thought of it as a sort of leisure wear, sportswear, casual brand. Um, you know, a step down from Calvin Klein, a step down from Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, but sort of part of the same family in a way. Um, but I did, I picked up on this. I mean, I, I certainly read something or picked up on this story or this the kind of a, a sort of a murkiness or a dubiousness about its sort of, um, it's, it, it's, 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 I don't know. It, it's it's racist credentials. <laughs> it you know it, there was something a little bit dark for such a white company, um, and basically I think I read this several years ago. This idea that okay, they only want, and it was to do with who they were willing to employ in their stores, which is fundamentally we only want beautiful people in the stores. And again, you kind of go okay, grand, and then it became closer to we really mainly want beautiful white people in the stores and they leaned into it so hard that at certain stores and at like openings of stores you'd have like topless male models in like in their Abercrombie and Fitch jeans and flip flops um that's thongs for the Australian listeners um standing at the you know at the front of the store welcoming people in and apparently the the, the stores then like they'd have like music blaring they'd also have this um their 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 trademark scent which was called fierce <laughs> basically pumped around the store so you basically be, you know be be blasted you know this kind of sensory overload stepping into the store and then lots of these kind of beautiful model like sales assistants and very few faces of color and part of the you know what the documentary is focusing on ultimately is how this became more and more explicit and how people were clearly not being hired or were being fired because they weren't good looking enough or because they weren't white enough um and in fact there was um a lawsuit a court case where a young american muslim woman took abercrombie and fitch to court because it became clear she wasn't being hired because of her headscarf, her hijab. And that went all the way to the Supreme the Supreme Court. Abercrombie and Fitch were like, no, we can fight this. <laughs> they couldn't. They lost. Um, and that, ultimately, that is kind of the story of the documentary. Um, and I don't know if I'm just looking for something deeper or looking for something meatier to sink my teeth into. But I found it didn't 
quite go deep enough or I found myself going is that it is that the story some white guy came up with a, an idea of what was cool um, and overtly proudly sort of declared yes we are exclusionary this is a shop for cool kids and cool people um, and I'm talking about the classic American cool kid and he never said the class you know that means white he never, I don't think he ever explicitly stated that, but that is very much what it was. Um, um, but it's interesting, like it's interesting. I, I kind of, it, I, I don't think they tapped into it enough in the documentary because I felt, well, surely this is, you know, really what this is about, this documentary is about sort of consumerism. It's about consumerism and marketing. It's about what's being sold to people uh, as being cool. It's what, uh, you know, what big brands do. They equate their brand with, with status, with exclusivity. Um, and in this case, it was all built around a white aesthetic. And it was all built around sexualizing, um, you know, beautiful men. And I mean, and that was something else that came out, uh, you know, again, a bit of a sort of a subtopic in the documentary was that clearly there was something that was very sort of homoerotic in the, the sort of iconography and the branding and the image making around Abercrombie and Fitch, chiseled, sculpted, ripped young men in jeans that barely went past their hips, not a body hair in sight. <laughs> these, these amazing hairless bodies. So just one Ken doll after another in tight jeans with, you know, a 26 pack um, and beautiful pecs and great delts and biceps. Um, the, the 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 photographer who aligned himself with the brand and created the the images was Bruce Weber. Bruce Weber um, subsequently found himself in hot water over sexual misconduct uh, allegations. Um, you know, of being accused by the male models of being inappropriate, and I found myself. I mean, I was looking. There was there was a there was one clip in the documentary of. A male, a young male model giving a press conference and talking about how Bruce Weber put his hands on him and they did breathing exercises together and then the male model started to cry. And I know the serious part of my brain goes, okay, there was a power dynamic here. Bruce Weber was a powerful photographer. Um, and I know this was a situation that is analogous to me too and someone was being taken advantage of and coerced that's the serious part of my brain but i i couldn't i found myself finding it very hard to take it seriously and maybe it's because you know bruce weber is like you know a middle-aged slightly overweight bearded gay man um with a, a little woolly hat on his head and a nice tweed jacket and a kind of a silky, not cravat, but kind of silky scarf. And he's looking, you know, he's talking about being, you know, taking, you know, <laughs> taking advantage of like a six foot four bodybuilder, fundamentally. So don't, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The conventional male model is a bodybuilder. Okay. Bodybuilders like, what the hell, bro? That's not right. But you know what I mean? Like these guys are guys who are fit and strong. They are physical specimens, which if you're a gay man, I mean, how would you not be trying to tap that as they say? How would you not want to be putting your hand on those boobies? No offense, lads. Um, I There you go. There's, there's me advocating um, sexual harassment. So I need to be, I need to be delisted. I need to be canceled. Anyway, I just couldn't help but feel like 
yeah, I, 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 I'm afraid I, I wasn't able to fully take that seriously. That was just me, in, you know, my sense of humour, whatever. I mean, it's also about aesthetics, isn't it? I mean, I had to look at that and go, so if that was a woman saying that she'd been taken advantage of by a man, I wouldn't hesitate to go, oh, yeah, that's crap. <laughs> so I'm kind of examining my own presuppositions, my own unconscious bias. Um, but... There were a couple of male models who were being interviewed now for that show. And, I, you know, again, I don't know if they were playing up. One of them definitely had one moment of playing up to the camera. But they definitely had that kind of Zoolander vibe. They definitely had that, you know, I know I'm good looking and kind of check me out vibe going on. Um and maybe that was the seed that was planted in my head. So when I got to see the scene with the guy doing the press conference, something comic was already floating around my brain. There you go. That's my disclaimer. Um, but anyway, again, I found myself going, how good is this as a piece of journalism? How good is it as a piece of journalism? Because ultimately, it was, I didn't find it like I, there was nothing shocking about it. There was nothing shocking about it. Um, and ultimately, a there was a class action taken against Abercrombie & Fitch by former employees, all people of colour, different ethnicities, not white. And they successfully took a class action against, um, against Abercrombie & Fitch for their hiring and firing practices, for their discrimination, and it was i think it was settled it was settled for 40 million dollars and basically abercrombie and fitch agreed to 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 accept a sort of a, a consent decree i think it was how it was described where they would improve their hiring standards but it was kind of unenforceable so it was all just a bit strange it was all a bit strange um and like and ultimately i kind of go well okay so this was a company who was called on their, you know, on their racist aesthetic and they fought back and lost. Um, and that's the story. It, like, it was a strangely unsatisfying narrative. It didn't really, you didn't get a sense of, oh yeah, you know, it, it was a bit, it was a little bit whatever. And ultimately those different controversies, they, Abercrombie Fitch also, by the way, had a line on t-shirts that sort of made racist puns and played with racist stereotypes. Um, there was something about Mexicans and donkeys, something about Chinese people and woks, um, or Asian people, sorry, Asian people and woks. Um, and, you know, those T-shirts got pulled, there were protests. So they, they just kind of kept finding themselves in the news for the wrong reasons, and ultimately their sales dropped off. And then there was a bounce back story and uh, a female CEO took over. Mike Jeffries left with his millions and Abercrombie & Fitch is kind of back at the top and has rebranded and is all inclusive. And they've, oh, that was, that was another thing about Abercrombie & Fitch. They had very limited sizes, so they didn't make clothes for fat people. And yeah, I mean, you know, that, that must exclude a lot of people in America. No offense, America. Um, so that's all changed. And apparently, you know, from what I read, from what I read, their clothes are great. <laughs> very trendy, very cool. And they've just done away with that whole that whole look from before. Um, and times have changed. Times have changed. So, you know, if you think like the, the sort of apex of Abercrombie and Fitch was the early 2000s. Um, I mean, a, a few episodes ago, I, you know, I, I looked at Woodstock. Was it Woodstock 99? 99? Again, very white, very white identity, very white crowd, very, very white America. And I suppose this is what's been percolating in my brain um, recently. The whole idea of representation who do you see what faces do you see what faces are presented as as beautiful and sexy um and yeah like you know white 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 for so long 
white, white, white. Now, I don't have a strong reaction to that, really, because because I'm white, um, because I'm Irish, because it's not my society, it's not my culture. And I was, a you know, if I'm thinking about movies, for example, as a particular aspect of that, you know, I loved movies. Uh, I loved a lot of different movies. And I just took it like, well, these are these are the movies. These are the faces. These are the characters. And I was interested in um, because I was interested in movies and interested in, you know, different stories and different directors. I was interested in black cinema and I was, a you know, Spike Lee. I was hugely on board with Spike Lee as soon as as soon as kind of do the right thing exploded and I wanted to go back and check out his earlier movies and you know when John Singleton emerged with Boys in the Hood I was on board as well the Hughes Brothers Menace to Society whatever and again this is not me kind of going I'm not trying to wave any kind of woke credentials but you know my interest was I wasn't just kind of taking oh my god I'm only interested in people like Robert Redford and Paul Newman um and then you know Harrison Ford was kind of my guy when I was a kid um that you know that was just whatever that was like what was I what else was I watching there was nothing else I mean I don't know what else was being presented to me um but like I was trying to put this into a context of I was thinking about this in the context of if you know if you're in Ireland for example and now Ireland has changed a lot in terms of um, in terms of ethnic diversity, um, particularly around the, the kind of larger population centres, um, it's less obvious around the, the, the rest of the country. And let's remind ourselves how small Ireland is. But like, you know, if you're growing up in Ireland um, and all you see are white faces um, on, on TV, um, across kind of music and popular culture and in fashion, it's completely unremarkable. It's completely unremarkable because <laughs> you don't get much whiter than Irish people. You know, a country that's starved, st- starved of sunshine, pasty faced um, peasants on the, the far fringes of Europe getting blasted out of it by the Atlantic Ocean and staring longingly at the shores of America. You know, that's 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 one part of the Irish story and um, looking longingly to Europe and, you know, warmer countries and healthier economies. That's part of the modern Irish story, you know, mass emigration, the brain drain, getting educated and leaving, pursuing economic opportunity elsewhere. Now, that said, things have changed. Things have changed. There is more color so to speak in ireland and it's really interesting to me like when i moved back from australia a couple of years ago and you watch irish tv and you when when ads come on when tv commercials come on there's so much ethnic diversity and ethnic representation in ads and i find it fascinating because i'm like oh, okay and, you know my first reaction is oh wow well, this is cool this is cool this is like modern ireland look at us we're all diverse and multicultural isn't that brilliant and then you kind of go, well, hold on a second. That's a company. That's a company thinking, this is what we want Irish people to think. We want Irish people to feel good and want Irish people to believe that they're not racist. And one way to demonstrate that is to show different people, different color, different faces, different ethnicities in our advertising and associate that. They'll make a positive association with our brand. And ultimately, it's all bullshit, of course. Ultimately, it's just branding. It's marketing. Something is being sold to us. And yet, and yet, the faces are still there. And I still can't separate that positive feeling. And now, now but here's the, here's the test. I have no clue what was being advertised. Um, I rarely remember the product. So that's my, um, that's my screw you advertisers. Screw you, mad men. But it is striking, and I was in a I was in a supermarket. Um, I was in a supermarket down in Arklo last week, and again, supermarket had its own, has its own little sort of clothing section, and all the 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 posters, the, the you know the, the the marketing poster ad boards above the clothing section featured a black model, and I was like, oh, and it was striking to me, because I'm like. 
again like you're down in the countryside in ireland and i got well that's kind of cool isn't it isn't it does it matter it does matter of course it bloody matters and that's ultimately where i'm going with this if you go back to america and you go there's a long history of racism and discrimination and people being shut out and kept down and abused and vilified and othered and in the early years of the 21st century after this long long history of racial division um of prejudice of the worst excesses of racist violence um that led to the the civil rights movement and if you're if you kind of if you're tapped into any of that history and you have a sense of the injustice of that um and you have a sense of the the violence of that and you have a sense of the the lack of representation and the lack of positive stereotypes and the limitation of the representations of people of color in across American popular media and the kind of curated presentation of acceptable versions of color across across popular media. And you throw all that into the mix and then it's the 21st, the 21st century You've crossed over. It's the 2000s. And one of the top fashion brands in the country, one of the most popular, most exclusive brands, is built around the idea of white beauty, of white excellence, of white supremacy. And that, like to me, that was, that's the more interesting story. That wasn't, emphasized explicitly enough in the documentary um you know ultimately you watch the documentary and it comes across like a party political broadcast on behalf of uh woke politics um and there's a righteousness in that that you kind of go yeah but it was also a bit like yeah whatever you know great you know rich white people acted like tools again um rich white people were um you know blinded by their own amazingness um and, you know and there is a there's a flavor of that in the and one documentary as well and then the last chance you series shows you that people of color are still massively disadvantaged and pathways out of poverty pathways out of that disadvantage are are limited are are fraught with chances of failure um and chances of no return um chances of being stuck in the poverty trap forever um it's um yeah like it's like I, like it's real i don't think it's i don't think it's imagined i don't think it's you know these are these aren't works of fiction um and that stuff is in the mix and i think that's why something like Last Chance You is is valuable um, because it's it, it you know it's bringing you in. So like Last Chance You for me is like if you were to only watch one of these things, I'd say watch Last Chance You basketball. Don't worry about the other ones because I think the level of journalism and now it's a, it's you know it's got eight episodes rather than just being a, a one off. Um, it, it just brings you closer. You just get a much closer look and sense of the experience um and look i don't know i mean like you can go okay so what it's just a show is it just food for thought is you know it is entertainment as well um but i don't know like i mean i, I kind of go well it's in, it's increasing your awareness it's increasing your sensitivity it's increasing your understanding and if that's all it does how is that how is that not a good thing how is that not a good thing if it just makes you think about things a little bit differently if it just broadens your parameters if it just p- 
pulls the curtains back just a little bit more. So you're taking a bit more and go, oh, okay, that's going on there. That's what that's like. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I'm, I, I find that stuff really interesting. Um, the Bruce Weber thing is interesting as well. The kind of idea of fetishizing beauty. Uh, that, that was another thing. I mean, if we're talking about that, though, you know, if we're talking about that idea that I, I, I referred to a moment ago, this idea of like, you know, white supremacy. Really, now this might be a stretch, but sure, it never stopped me before. Abercrombie and Fitch and the kind of iconography of Abercrombie and Fitch, very much, very much analogous to Third Reich iconography and the films of um, Lenny Riefenstahl. Um, the, you know, the famous black and white propaganda movies that she made to glamorize and glorify beautiful, young, Aryan, idealized, um, you, you know, figures of, the, of, of Hitler's dream. Um, blonde, chiseled, sculpted, beautiful, athletic, outdoors healthy sporty all of that and again sort of fetishized glamorized idealized shot from below made to look statuesque made to look godlike um now maybe not as overtly sexualized as the bruce weber imagery but that was very much in the mix. And in fact, you saw at one point in the documentary for the Abercrombie and for one of the, you saw an image from one of the Abercrombie and Fitch stores, which featured like a wall with this huge mural of straining men in a gym in very kind of old school, traditional, you know, using very old school, traditional gym equipment, like the climbing ropes and the rings and, you know, kind of, you know, these, you know, young men striving for physical greatness, but very, again, impossible not to make a sort of a, a sexual connection as well, that homoerotic thing. Um, and again, I think that was something that was suggested, but not explicitly stated that Mike Jeffries, this was part of his, this was part of his um, sort of fantasy aesthetic, you know, these, you know, striving, writhing, bare chested, beautiful white boys, um, you know, scrambled, <laughs> scrambled like crushed avocado <laughs> on toast, um, you know, scrambled and layered all over each other with a sprinkling of, you know, salt and pepper um, and, and, and paprika, perhaps, um, that was in the mix and it, it's kind of laughable it's kind of hilarious you know go oh, okay so this is this one guy's this is what i want and we'll throw in some beautiful women as well and this is just going to be you know what everybody wants and um you know has that aesthetic gone away i don't think so i don't think so i mean maybe the you know, like fundamentally people still look to rich beautiful people um as 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 the standard of 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 beauty as the standard of of physical and aesthetic um success accomplishment achievement um as sort of lifestyle fantasy and sure, you can argue, well, okay, it's, it's been 20 years, you know, we've moved on. And now, you know, rich and beautiful can be many different colors and can also be many different shapes. And I, you know, I'm like, yeah, Grant, I, I just, I have so little interest, really. In, in, you know, that's, you know, I, I was thinking about it. The whole idea of being solely fixated on the external um it's so i don't know it, 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 it it's so limited and 
don't get me wrong i can appreciate a good looking person you know as well as the next man whether male or female whether actor musician model athlete whoever certainly my eyes are tuned in to things that look nice in the world and people are in that mix um but as the kind of it's not an obsession now i will say at one point in my probably in my early 20s um there probably was a little bit of my brain was seduced by that it never <laughs> it never it never transferred back to myself there was no i will also look like this i never had that aspiration and i never had that belief that i could in any way come close to hitting those uh, those heights of aesthetic perfection um i didn't even approach the lows of aesthetic anything um but, but <laughs> excuse me sorry i do know i had a book i had a book like a huge coffee table book that this is from when i was working in the in you know my bookshop days back in the bookshop days after after college and there was a huge coffee table book i can't even remember what the name of it was but it was i think it was a book by um by herb ritz and it was a huge thing very expensive book i availed of um i availed of my my discount to 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 to, you know to get it um and it was just these notorious notorious that's what it was called notorious and i see here i'm just looking online i see here first edition notorious you can get that online for 175 euros um so it's um it's gone up i guess um yeah but basically what it was 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 you know these kind of matte black and white photos of celebrities and yeah this unadulterated fetishization of of beauty um and i think there was just a brief spell in my early 20s where i was i was just seduced i was seduced by that that idea just um beautiful people um and probably from my teens i would argue until then i remember spending a summer in in, in america uh, working on a farm I, I i have mentioned this before this is an old story for listeners of 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 the tell um my summer in michigan in uh, 1990 and i remember coming back from america that summer and i had a copy of people magazine is that what it was called i think it was people magazine and it was like the 50 most beautiful people in the world and um i think michelle pfeiffer might have been the number one face but people like denzel washington were in it and tom cruise a lot of actors an awful lot of actors in the mix some basketball players as well models inevitably but um i think it was part i think it was part of my relationship to to actors my relationship to to movies particularly american movies um and yeah i don't know i think maybe in my maybe in my you know my 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 monkey brain i i was sort of thinking okay i want to act maybe i don't know i I guess there was a sort i suppose there was a certain aspect of hero worship to an extent um and just kind of going yeah these are beautiful people and they're also talented and i kind of love them (laughs) it might be as 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 one dimensional as that um and certainly people like uh david bowie i felt was like a, an icon of cool kind of growing up in the in in the 80s um and i thought yeah that would be that'd be great wouldn't it be great to be as uh, you know to look as cool as david bowie um and so that kind of that was definitely in the mix it was kind of certainly part of yeah i don't know how to describe this what it falls into like my 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 frame of reference um my 
was there something aspirational in there um but then i don't know i think i i just i don't know it, it, that that kind of fell away um but i suppose it may also have been connected to um an interest in photography um and taking photographs and capturing you know images and particularly portraiture and trying to you know get a great photograph of someone um and that i you know I, i've kind of fallen out of that habit but it was sort of it was always in the mix and there is there is still something to me something you know striking um and appealing about a you know about a great a great portrait and a great photograph of somebody um and then you, you know particularly you capture someone in their prime i guess uh you know in the prime of their sort of physical beauty that can still that can still catch the eye i mean as you get older that becomes maybe less interesting um and maybe you're looking for something that's more character driven that shows more experience that you're yeah i don't know i don't know anyway look whatever what's the conclusion what is the conclusion to this the conclusion is I don't know. That's not very satisfying, is it? The conclusion is marketing and branding is is not to be trusted. Um ask yourself <laughs> ask yourself what 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 really is you know what really is cool? You know what really is attractive and beautiful? Um what does that mean to you because for me it was always sort of at a remove even though i was kind of like oh yeah isn't michelle pfeiffer beautiful doesn't denzel washington look amazing isn't harrison ford like you know the ultimate cool suave macho tough charming funny guy um there, there was always a distance there was always a distance it never felt it never felt that real and i suppose there's an aspect then like as i said i mean i used the phrase hero worship earlier i mean it's um there is an aspect of you know putting these people at distance and they're sort of godlike and you can't help but have this thing of looking up at them um but then i kind of go well you, you, you can't stay there you can't stay in that place of adulation you can't stay in that place of emulation it's like get on with your life get on with your life it's just entertainment it's just a snapshot it's just a movie it's just a scene it's just a moment um and i never really ever succumbed to that level of fanaticism i suppose and i don't think i've ever looked at a clothing brand and thought i need that i must have that um i don't know i just had um other concerns and as i say i <laughs> they just they're always i mean I, I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago didn't i the idea that like you know hey i'm a cool guy don't get me wrong but like the effort to be cool when it's not a natural impulse it's like i cannot be bothered life's too short you know i've got um i've got leaves to to rake i've got a bad poem to write um i've got classes to teach I've got work to do on myself. <laughs> All of that is more important. Um, I gotta stay healthy and strong, and um, and also I'm not a kid anymore. Um, but yeah, those those three shows I watched. Um, they all they all tell a story. They have all got there's something in there. There's something in there about the black experience. There's something in there about exploitation. There's something in there about representation and identity and selling ideas of of what is attractive and what is desirable. Um, and then there's stories about like what's real, what's real and what, you know, what the real struggle is and what the real journey is. Um, and I guess it's changing. And I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know where the end point will be how 
society forever it's going to involve evolve particularly in america america is a very divided country it's probably never been more explicitly divided um, certainly in recent times um it's hard to know it's hard to know where this where this will end you know ultimately my conviction is we all you know you know the aspiration that i think of is like you know we need to get past everything you know post post identity post race post gender um ultimately you know survival is going to be about um resources it's going to be about access to housing access to healthcare access to education access to um to 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 to, to opportunity um and it's you know it, it's economic it's economic it, it it you know comes down to to money distribution of wealth and a more level playing field and everything else is just distraction it's just distraction um and that doesn't mean people aren't allowed to air their grievances that doesn't mean you throw out the history books that doesn't mean you don't look at things honestly that doesn't mean there aren't uh power imbalances and institutionalized abuses um systemic um discrimination and disenfranchisement um but like as i say the aspiration is we've got to i don't know i don't know i don't know what the i mean like like does it require a revolution does it require blood in the streets um how do you kind of i don't know ultimately i just think christ get educated use your bloody brain don't fall for the marketing don't fall for the branding don't get distracted by the show you can enjoy the show but just try and keep it real just try and keep your feet on the ground just try and you know carve your own path um and don't be as you know don't be as concerned with kind of carving your body <laughs> you're you know working on the six pack yeah i don't know anyway there you go so look as i said before if you watch one of them only going to watch one of them i recommend last chance you basketball that's uh that was a very interesting and cool and moving um moving series well worth checking out okay that's me that's me done for another day i have i have some tai chi to teach holistic fell self-defense went well last night thanks very much so that's going to keep rolling for the next few tuesdays in the Broca center in lara if you're a local listener um otherwise i will be back next week with more of more of what more of something more of something not sure what um it's been the clear out it's been wellness with attitude it's been a bit sloppy and a bit messy um and not so great to look at unlike abercrombie and fitch advertising campaigns you can throw me some love on social media the clear out podcast is on instagram and youtube and facebook you can email me at the clear out live at gmail.com you can tweet at the clear out too and if you want to support this podcast financially throw a bit of financial love at the tell you can do so there should be a supporter link wherever you're listening to this where you can make a one-off contribution or you can become a patron someone who goes yeah i patronize the arts the creative process i saw something just the other day that says eroticism is very much a part of creativity creativity is erotic unpredictable spontaneous yeah have a think about that so maybe you know the erotic maybe that's something we can talk about um you can become a patron using the link patreon.com forward slash the clear out and become a regular contributor to the show just the the price of a an old sandwich or something once a month something like that okay thanks for listening as always mind yourself keep your clothes on um don't believe the branding make up your own mind know your own thoughts 
that's all I've got. I will talk to you real soon. Or in just house. Take care. All the best. Bye.